I'm Stefan Bauman and welcome to the Bauman Effect number 18. Today we are just packing this video with all kinds of information. We are going to be talking about composition and alpine glow. On top of everything else, we're going to be talking about rainbows and the law of thirds. This secret of creating light is going to be discussed in this video. We have discussed horizons and the point of view or the line of sight that artists need to understand. We're going to talk a little bit about canvases and the truth behind canvases. And we're also going to uncover Grisaille, that elusive underpainting that people want to know so much about. We're going to discuss concepts and balance, checkering of values and chunking of value planes. We're going to learn a little bit about stacking. We're going to talk about toning your canvas and whether that's a good idea or not. We're going to talk about secrets and lies about white. What is the secret behind white and why is everybody afraid of zinc? We're going to talk about temperatures and transitions, reflections, and so much more in this brief video. So sit back and relax, pour yourself a nice drink and watch the Bauman effect number 18, Secrets and Lies. So Mount Shasta, this time Mount Shasta at sunset when it's absolutely beautiful. Mount Shasta loves Alpine glow. The great thing about Mount Shasta is when, it, when the sun is setting and that light comes in. Again, when I'm um, at different places, I stop my car and just stare at it and go, oh, what a beautiful, what a beautiful place we live in. Um, this particular scene, uh, Mount Shasta is known for its lavender fields. Um, and uh, this particular scene is actually uh, where the big fire happened. In fact, where I'm going to be painting right now, I'm recalling that that's exactly where all of the fires were a couple of years ago, I mean, a couple of months ago. So this area doesn't exist anymore. Well, it doesn't exist with all the trees and stuff, but um, we'll make it exist forever on my painting. Now, the law of thirds. Third, 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 okay? I'm gonna just do this dynamically. You gotta kind of always remember is that your focal point is always in the middle third. That's where your main focal point is. Also, since we are standing here in front of Mount Shasta, our horizon line, the, the line that our eyes are at, is not up here where the sky hits the mountain. Okay, that's not where the horizon line is. The horizon line is where your eye level line is. You should never get that, uh, make that mistake again. Now, if you watch my video with Eric, he was saying that an artist was saying, well, you can always find the horizon line by putting you know, your brush here and that would be your horizon line. And if you look down, then that would be your horizon line down there. That's not true. That's your point of view. Yeah, if I look up, that's my point of view. But my horizon line always stays the same. So, the horizon line. And the horizon line is going to be dead center in your painting. Okay, because that's what you're, you're telling the viewer what you want them to look at, is dead center in the paint. Now I know some of you are jumping up at the screen going, but you don't put a horizon line in the middle of the painting, don't put anything in the middle of the painting, no, that's bad. No, no, it's good. You have to have something in the middle of the painting, relax, okay? You want to go to the middle of the painting and then maybe take it down a little bit either lower or higher in this particular instance because I want to have a little bit more mountains of Mount Shasta, I'm going to push the horizon line just below the middle line. That's going to be my horizon line. My mountains are going to go up from there. In fact, I may even lower it just a little bit more. But I don't want to get out of that line of sight. If I'm actually looking at something, yeah, I'm looking at it. And if, and if there's bear running or cars going across or whatever, I'm looking at it. I'm not looking like this and then turning my eyes up and looking at like this. You know, like, it's like, no, I'm looking at it. So the middle of the painting is going to be that. And I tell you these things, not to nag you. I tell you these things 
because I made all these mistakes, you know. I have been painting as long <laughs> as long as anyone else. There you have the horizon line. This is the horizon line in the middle. We're gonna lower it just enough, but that might even be just a tad too low. This is gonna be my, my Mount Shasta. I'm going to um, put the main peaks of Mount Shasta in the middle part of my painting, again in the middle third, because that's where I'm gonna be looking, and low enough so that it's getting close to my central focal point. Now, this is a white ampersand board. Love ampersand, but you don't need to spend that kind of money on boards. You have no business doing that. You're a starving artist. You need to go down to Home Depot, get yourself a big sheet of that MDF, medium density fiber board. Eighth of an inch, quarter of an inch. Pay somebody a couple bucks, cut it up into all these sizes. Now remember, if you're painting outdoors, this is a 12 by 16, never paint anything smaller. You're not gonna get money for a smaller painting. It's not worth it. You're gonna also hang that small painting in a bathroom. Great place, but not for fine art. All right, so in this middle area, we're going to have the, the, the mountain on this. It's a white board, I didn't stain it yet. I don't like staining my boards with a, a brown or whatever. This is like, a, almost like a grisaille, but even a grisaille could have a little color in it. So here's my mountains. My main focal area is gonna be within this square. So something has to happen in this that says, hey, Look over here. And what's gonna happen here is gonna dictate what's gonna to happen to the painting. Now we could put in a bear running across the road here. Ah, bear running in the meadow, that would catch our attention. Whatever it is, and I'm not quite sure what it is right now, I'm just developing my concept, is that it has to be within this middle third. Most likely what I'm gonna do is make it a lighting effect because we don't paint things, we paint effects. Although when we get a thing like a bear running through, it's kind of hard to concentrate on that as opposed to anything else. So uh, we paint effects, and it's come up a couple of times in my Patreon and my coaching this week, and that is this. A great painting consists of an effect, a grand effect somewhere in the middle of our focal point. And so we want the effect of light because we don't paint things, we paint effects. Now there's one thing that trumps the central focal point being an effect of light. There's one thing that does. The one thing that trumps a central focal point that is an effect of light is a feeling. If you can capture a feeling in a painting, you can trump the effect of a painting. What does that mean? I have seen paintings of foggy days where the feeling was so spectacular. Uh, there's a feeling of springtime. Usually there is a lighting effect of some kind, but sometimes not. Sometimes the whole painting takes on just an essence, that the essence stimulates my subconscious to fall in love with the moment. I can recall something. You know, we're all usually blasted so much, so we, we, we you know, see the effect of things, and we go, oh yeah, and we try to remember that for our painting. But if you can capture a feeling, and you know what that's like. Sometimes you'll walk out to a meadow and you go, God, there's very little light, but man, it feels good. I mean, sometimes when the sun's already down and there's no light, there's a sense of feeling in that. And if you can actually render that and render it in a way that it, it, it stimulates viewers, because remember, painting is all a conversation. It's about using language of, of, of sight to be able to communicate words. And if you can, communi can communicate a moment of time, a feeling that, is, that uh, generates a, a memory, then you've got a true masterpiece. So think about that. So you've got elements, wind and rain, and you know, that reminds us a lot of stuff too, but feeling. And that kind of goes along with the elements. Really it's making it feel wet, making it feel windy. So. All right, so somewhere in here, I'm gonna have my center focal point. My light's going to actually be coming forward because this is all an alpine glow. Um, I'm going to place uh, a little lake in here. 
I'm going to do some fancy little rocks here. I'm, you know, again, I'm just kind of dwelling from my memory and things that I remember. When we have the sun coming, and this is another mistake that a lot of artists do, and let's just kind of clear up some of this stuff. Putting rainbows in your painting. You know, if you're at the North Rim, you don't see rainbows. Why at the South Rim? How do we paint rainbows? How, how do they appear to us? The reality is you don't want to make a mistake. Because I'm out there judging art shows. And if I see this wrong, it's like, oh, that artist needs to watch this video. But you can't have a rainbow unless the sun is directly behind you. You can't have a rainbow. So if you see a rainbow, that's why at the South Rim you see rainbows, but you don't see them from the North Rim. You look at the sun from the North Rim, but the Southern exposure is like, you know, when you're looking at a, uh, at a, at a subject that, and you see a rainbow, the sun's directly behind you. So you could walk around when you're watering your lawn and you could see when the sun goes this way and it's behind you and you've got your hose this way, you'll see the rainbow. So any painting, so I could literally put a rainbow in here if I wanted as an effect because the sun is directly behind us. It's just kind of a really flat light. It's the kind of light I tell people not to do, but only if they're doing dogs and portraits. So, um, so here's uh, the rainbow. Yeah, if, it, if we would have it, it would be behind us. The light's coming from behind us. This is going to be a feeling painting. I'm going to put a lake in here. Uh, on the other side of the lake, I'm going to put some trees. Da -da -da -da. Now, if I'm out on location, believe it or not, this would be the first three or four minutes of my painting. And this is all subject to, to an idea that I have in my head. And a lot of times the logistics gets worked out as I'm painting. Um, I kind of like to see some larger trees here. I love trees. This, and compositionally, um, these will be up forward. Notice they're on the kind of like balance-wise. So we have balance. We have a big object here. We're gonna balance it out with something over here. And don't commit too soon. Come up with an idea, a concept. Let it mull a little bit, see if you like it. But here we have t tall objects. This is a, a tall object here. This is a main. So balance-wise, I need to get enough weight on this side to balance this over here. I'm also paying attention to stacking. So I've got big trees over here, smaller trees over here, smaller trees. So we end up with a zigzag. Big trees, smaller trees, smallest trees. And it's the same thing when we're doing uh, still lives. You always want something big and then something smaller and then something really small. Always try to find different masses. We call this chunking in when we're doing a painting. We kind of chunk it in and say, okay, this is, this is a, ch a, a value chunk here. This will be a value chunk here. Maybe we'll talk about doing chunks first here so you can kind of get an idea of what that is, value chunks, where you value painters. All right. So, and I think what I'll do is I'll bring the lighting effect strong here that's within my middle third. I want to paint kind of an alpine glow, an alpine glow is kind of a, a, a pinkish color reflecting the sun. Growing up in Lake Tahoe, I'd hear people go, oh, that's an alpine glow, and i go, what does that mean? But now since I live in, my house literally has an alpine glow. If you come to my workshops, you can literally just be on my front porch and you could just paint Mount Shasta just like this. This, this idea here is about um, 10 miles north, but still spectacular. Okay, now the last time I painted on uh, for you guys, I got a lot of people that say, whoa, what about values? What about, you know, getting, it's like right now I'm about color. I'm about putting something on that has some intensity. Most of the paintings that I see nowadays, it's like people are just afraid of putting any, any real good color on their canvases. Oh, look at that color, man. People go, you're so stodgy. You paint in such traditional colors. Why don't you, it's like, no, I start off this way. It's like, wow. 
That's crazy. I don't know if you see it on the video, but that's like, wow, it's on fire. It's intense. It's like, you know, but, but the thing is, how are you going to get that color on there? And the thing is, you want to get lots of paint on there. So let's, let's, uh, let's get it intense. And I'm going to have it get darker in the corners. And I'm going to deal with that later. Okay, so these are kind of like chunky. Now, a lot of the, the artists out there, they tell you to chunk in four or five value planes, some three to four value planes. So this would be a chunk, that would be a chunk, this would be a chunk, this would be a chunk, and this would be a chunk. And usually they tell you kind of concentrate your value planes and organize them so that they're interesting shapes on their own. And once you have that value plane in there, then you can go and start adjusting everything in there. And you don't want to have more than four or five value planes because you don't want to confuse the viewer. And I totally agree. You don't need to make this so complicated. But my value planes right now are actually more like color chunks. Now, I'll worry about getting the value next, but right now I'm getting the concept, what I want to see. And I want to see a painting that when it, people walk into that gallery, they go, whoa, look at that. It's realistic but it's colorful. It's not this drab, gray, planar mishmash with no direction on it. It's like, boom, it's sunrise. Asphaltum, one of my favorite colors in the whole world. So misunderstood. We call it mummy, mummy, uh, mummy paint. And if you're just tuning in, You'll have to watch some of my videos where we discuss asphaltum. Going across here, that's going to be my lake in here. I said I wanted some taller trees in here. Guy's out of control. Now, I'm not one of these artists that starts off with a photograph and, you know, and relies on my photograph to be perfect. You know, a lot of these artists, they, they go into a lot of Photoshop. It's like, oh yeah, put it in Photoshop and let's move it. It's like, I'm a little old fashioned. I don't quite know Photoshop that well. I should, but the thing is, it's like, it's like my Photoshop's in my head and it's all on the right side of the brain. You can push things around I make decisions. But some people will print these out on, on photo paper and then they put it behind glass and they'll match the colors and they'll put them on. They think that you know, everything that goes on to a painting is permanent, it's there for life, you can't change it. They work from the top left-hand corner all the way down, and they never get to experience accidents. And like, you know, I, the key to painting is in the realm of, and my students are saying it already, oh shit, that's where art's created where you don't quite have control over it. Because if you have control over it, you're not painting anything that's any bigger or better than what you painted before. You gotta push it out there. You gotta trust that you can fix it. And if you can't fix it, you don't really know it, do you? Okay, so. So, and you can hear, if you can hear my brush like that, it sounds like I'm scrubbing tile. It's not a good thing. And if you're going to do that, do it with bristle brushes. But it's okay at the first. And then as we go, we will uh, quiet down the brush strokes. But I'm going to take uh, asphaltum and ultramarine blue. <laughs> Get that foreground all in shadow so that's illuminated light. And my main key right now of what I'm trying to do is get rid of all that white canvas. But I'm not going to tone the canvas at first and then put in my white and then you know wait for that to dry so if you come into my workshops don't tone your your canvases before you show up so we're getting rid of that because we can't really see what color anything is and if you notice as I'm filling this in and this is just asphalt and ultramarine it's like oh the guy's just crazy okay then I've got a couple of Footnotes here, brush stroke here. It's like there are going to be some, some tall trees there, maybe something a little bit smaller. Again, I'm trying to focus the viewer in here. I probably will make a, a focal point of some kind, the element of light. Remember, you want to try to get your concept down first. But trying to get that element of light in the middle third. Remember how I said the middle third? Now, I'm probably going to put something in right there. 
right in there. Now my light's going to be coming this way, so I'm not going to be concentrating on having the light come in either way. We're just going to put that there. And since it's summertime, the sun is setting on that side. The opposite of the sun is the moon. I'm going to put the I'm going to put a moon in. I'm going to put that in. So remember my main focal point area, all that. For right now, let's put a footnote right there. So what type of white are you using, Stefan? I don't know. I don't care. It could be titanium white. It could be Kremitz white. It could be opaque white. White's, a, white's just a value maker. There's no magic in your whites. And you zinc painters out there, knock it off. Zinc's a nice color too. It's in Promalba. Most of your tubes that you're going, oh, I'm using titanium. Well, if you read the label, there's zinc in there too, so it's, it's having too much knowledge. Do you think that Beershaw was wandering around going, oh my God, I don't have, all my tubes have zinc in them. What am I going to do? I'm in Yosemite. The nearest art store is 3,000 miles away. What am I going to do? It's like, oh, come on. Give me a break. Okay, so we're going to put a full moon here. Beautiful August. I tell you, if you ever come to Mount Shasta, you land your plane in Medford. You rent a car. You drive an hour and a half south. One of the most beautiful drives you'll ever be. And I've been all over with the National Park PBS show. I've been all over. There's a reason why I live in Mount Shasta. It's cheap. No. <laughs> it's cheaper than anywhere else, but the thing is, it is as beautiful as the Tetons. It really is. And when you come down off that hill, you swear you are looking at a prop for a major movie like The Hobbit. The, the mountain is extraordinary. The mountain itself is as high as Mount Whitney, just shy of a few yards. Um, it is just, or a few feet even. Um, it is a spectacular mountain. People die every year trying to climb it. It's that kind of mountain that, that is, uh, you can't just hike up in there. You have to plan on doing it. You can only do it at certain times of the year. All right, so here we go. There's my concept. I'm going to start working with the sky here. I'm using Liquin. And I'm going to add a little bit of lemon yellow as I get down to the horizon. So I'm going to lighten the value as we get towards the mountain peaks. And the key to painting is always in the transitions. And, and here I'm just going to go over my trees. They're not holy relics. If you watched my demo last week on painting trees, you realize that uh, you can wipe things down and take things away, put them back on again. Okay, so I'm going to be lightening my blue around the mountain in the center because I do have the light coming, the alpine glow coming this way. And as it comes this way, um, I want to make sure that the illuminated lights around my mountain and I want to have transition. Remember, transition is where the magic goes. For some people who are familiar with band organs, band organs are great, I love them. You put a quarter in and they play all the band. But you can only listen to them for a couple of minutes because that sound is just, there's no crescendos, there's no transitions. There's none of that beautiful thing that makes music, music. Um, and same thing with painting. Every inch of your painting needs to go through some kind of transition, either light to dark or warm to cool. And so I'm going to lighten color in the middle. I'm going to darken as it gets off to the outside. So Nate was talking about having the, the, the light of the sun being cool and the shadows are going to be warm. What are you going to, how you can handle these transitions? Um, yeah, so there's some keys here for those of you that are trying to to uh, figure something out without quite getting into the Patreon site. It's like, oh, I don't quite want to go in there because it's $5 a month. But you know, the thing is, there's so much to learn in these sites and I'm trying to produce as many videos as I can, but I'm off. Do you have tips for how to solve if you do get paint on your clothes? Okay. 
So, one of the secrets that I have found about not getting paint on your clothes, and also, you, know, you notice I don't have gloves on. I'm, just, I'm not fearful that my, glove, my paint's going to seep through my, my hands. Um, lead paint, which everything is everybody's afraid of, the particles are too big to go actually through your hands. So you, you've got to digest them, you've got to actually eat lead paint to have it go into your body. And it's only really dangerous for children that are growing, okay, in their brain development. So that's really, you know, one of the fallacies of that. Um, most of your paint products out there have no uh, health labels. A lot of the caddings and stuff have been taken out, so that's... But the question was, how do I say so beautiful and, and svelte and have all of my stuff without paint all over it? And one key that I have found out to doing that is buy really expensive clothes. And you could kind of pay attention to that a little bit. These waistcoats are very expensive. They're custom made for me. And there will be a point where I'm not going to have them anymore, so I don't want to spoil them. But um, having very expensive clothes helps. Being con cautious when you, of, of your paints, being a, a neat painter. I wasn't always this way, I tell you. I, I started off being the worst painter in the classroom. When I was 13, the students would just flee away from me because they were fearful I'd get paint on them. Um, also, I don't use any of those colors that cause that. Um, here I'm doing some interesting brush strokes. I'm not painting a bathroom, so I'm not going this way, you know, like people do. You know, it's like, I'm actually like putting in. Now, thing on brush strokes. Um, also, you know, getting back to the clothing. Don't use the yellow blue, Prussian blue. Um, what are some of the other colors? Elizabeth Crimson has a tendency to get a little crazy, but you know, you shouldn't be using Elizabeth Crimson anyway. Um, but the thalo blue is the worst, Prussian blue. I've had people actually like, you know, be totally dressed and go to the grocery store, hand the, the clerk a $10 bill, and all of a sudden the clerk is covered with Prussian blue. It's just, it's just that, you know, we don't use that. And Prussian blue is one of those, uh, great ideas that really isn't a color that I would recommend at this point in my life um, because of that. But I wanted to tell you something about brush strokes because that's what you tune in. Not for my stories, but for my knowledge. Anyway, if you do a brush stroke and you do it this way, it actually will appear brighter. That's because all of the hairs and everything form like a level or blinds and they, they all kind of go at an angle and the light actually will actually like go across that. So if you're making a highlight, the horizontal stroke will actually give the effect of it being brighter. So when I'm putting in the moon, I'm going to try to get a horizontal line. Now, if I want a line of the same color, but I don't quite the, want the intensity, a vertical stroke will do. So a vertical stroke will actually be more up here. I, I don't want to have a lot of um, light in this area, so I'll predominantly do a vertical stroke out here. Vertical strokes, uh, the light kind of falls down and doesn't have quite the reflective quality. Part two will be the lake and all that. And just to give you one more thing before we uh, turn off here, so we have a couple more minutes, but you're looking at this lake thing. Yeah, we can't really tell the color of something until we get rid of all the white. So that's really, really crucial. So what I want to do is I want to paint in a lake here. Now, in my last demo, I explained this is that when you are painting a lake and it has a reflection, you always pull down. It's always down strokes. And in this particular area in the center, we're going to put a reflection of the mountains and the water down strokes. And like I said, this is pure uh, color here. Down, down, down. Intense color, but notice I'm going down. This this whole opening here is going to be a lake. Now, I'm only going to be reflecting the light colors in here because when you're reflecting on water, the thing that really reflects is the light, not the shadow. So as I transition to the outside part of my sky, it's getting darker, it's more shadows. That won't quite push the same kind of light onto the lake like the center will. And also, this color here that I'm using in here will eventually be more intense than the color that's in the sky or in the mountain. 
because it's closer and the, the, the angle of the lake has everything to do with how that's going to turn out. So down, down, down. And of course, if we're going to be putting the moon in, the moon is a source of light, so that's our moon here. Remember I was going to say I'm going to probably do a horizontal line eventually. And if you tune in next time, and I'm working on this, I'm going to show you a little secret on doing moons and stuff. But I won't do that. You've got to have something. Stay tuned till next week. Um, but anyway, so we're going to bring in the reflection of the moon also in the lake. It's the Lady of the Lake. Okay. And we're going to go down, down. Always making sure that the lines point down. Down, 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 down. Down, across, down, 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 down. And then once you have that in, some horizontal strokes. You just do a few horizontal strokes. Now for those of you that are painting with extra credit and watching, I only used one brush this whole time for this so far. And I can, at this point, turn the brush at an angle and I can start going back and forth like this. And that takes the vertical lines and makes it horizontal and you get a beautiful reflection off of that. So make sure that you always go horizontal and then uh, vertical to get the lines in. And like I said, this is, this is all the preliminary stuff. Paint the changing of the season from, from summer to fall. You're on the edge of a season. How would you render that? Give us a feeling. It's also fall because you can hear the wind blowing the, the trees, the, 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 the leaves off the trees. And if you want extra credit, put the element of wind and that feeling of the, the, the leaves flying off. I mean, just think of that. That's exciting. You know, if you live someplace that has that. If you don't, I'm sorry. But if you could find a place where you have uh, transitioning of wind, that would be fabulous. So uh, the element of wind or rain is great. If you live back east in Florida, paint a hurricane. Get some PR. Call the press and say, there's a crazy lady painting a hurricane out here. Get your cameras. Get some press, national press, worldwide press, BBC. Okay, so you guys are always, when I always talk about marketing. Anyway, it's time to go. But always remember, don't go into your studio unless you're going to change the world. And this week you're going to do it with elements of wind and rain. And always remember to paint with passion. The world has a lot of boring paintings out there. Don't contribute anymore. Paint something that has something that wakes people up and shows them light or wind or, or power of nature. And until next week, well, paint with passion. And I'll see you next time on the Bauman Effect. Boy, that was a huge suitcase that we unpacked with his last demo. And it's only just halfway. If you want to get more information on the Bauman Effect, you can do so by going to my website at www.stephanbauman.com. And there you can register for a free book, Everything I Know About Painting. If you wish to get information about my workshops, you could do so there at the site or just give me a call. We'd love to register you. It's twice a year up in my ranch in Mount Shasta. And if you wish to have coaching, just give me a call at 415-606-9074. That is my personal cell phone number and I do answer it. So till the next time, always remember to paint with passion. And don't go into the studio unless you plan to change the world. I'm Stefan Bauman, and thanks for watching. <laughs>